In a world with so many movies to choose from, one hero will rise. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Movie Wire Podcast. With just a piece. Fragile. It must be Italian. I'm Buddy the Elf. We're going to have the hap, hap, happiest Christmas. Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. And a happy new year. Oh my god, I shot my eye out. I give you the Griswold family Christmas. I say bah. Humbug. Welcome to this week's edition of the Movie Wire. I'm your host, Justin Henson, and welcome to the show. I hope all of you had a great Thanksgiving, and those of you that tuned in to listen to me and Brooklyn's Thanksgiving special, a special thank you to you. This week, we have four brand new films to cover, one for streaming, and three for theatrical. This week on the show, Ralph Fiennes plays a chef with a very special menu for his guests that they won't see coming in the new dark comedy thriller, The Menu. A sweet coming-of-age love story of two people who go on a road trip and have to rely on each other. Oh, and just a heads up, they're cannibals in Bones and All. The true story surrounding the Harvey Weinstein investigation from the New York Times article in She Said. And finally, available only on streaming platforms, a controversial talk show host has his family taken hostage while on the air in the new Mel Gibson film On the Line. Ready for my verdict? Let's get into it. A young couple travels to a remote island to eat at an exclusive restaurant where the chef has prepared a lavish menu with some shocking surprises in the new horror thriller, The Menu. Get everyone? Yeah, easily. 12 customers total. How do they turn a profit? 12.50 a head, that's how. What are we eating, a Rolex? It's one of his classics. You have to try the mouthfeel of the mignonette. Please don't say mouthfeel. Tonight will be madness. Welcome. We'll endeavor to make your evening as pleasant as possible. Welcome to Hawthorne. Here we are family. We harvest, we ferment, we gel. They gel? We gel. He's not just a chef, he's a storyteller. The game is trying to guess what the overarching theme of the entire meal is going to be. You won't know till the end. Who are you? I am Margo. Why do you care? I have to know if you're with us or with them. This menu. The pictures, they're of us. This guest list. How do they get these? It's not good. This entire evening. Jesus Christ. This is just theater. It's stagecraft. We're leaving now. Has been painstakingly planned. This is real, isn't it? What the hell is going on? We now offer you a 45 second head start. <laughs> okay, 45 second starts now. This is what you're paying for. Get out of my way. It's all part of the menu. It's okay. No, we're gonna die today. Yes, we are. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. You told them it was my birthday? Seemed funny about three hours ago. If they turned Hell's Kitchen into a horror or a thriller, this would be it. I am still up in the air on who I'm more intimidated by, Chef Gordon Ramsay or Chef Ralph Fiennes. But I will say this, when Chef Slowick, played by Ralph Fiennes, asks a question by the end of the film, I wanted to get up from my theater seat and yell, yes, chef. The menu is an obvious attempt at a satire about social status, and it uses its food and restaurant as a metaphor to its messaging, where the topic of the message is clear on what the film is going after, but the sub-messaging to support the theme tends to be all over the place, and at 
at times can get lost in translation. It tries to overcomplicate itself on a basic symbolic message. The menu follows a handful of high-class rich restaurant goers, and the cast here is at top form. Alongside Ralph Fiennes, we have Nicholas Holt that most will recognize from the last X-Men trilogy as Beast, John Leguizamo, who has another film being released next week as well, Janet Petir, and a pleasant surprise whenever she pops up is Judith Light from one of my favorite shows of the 80s, Who's the Boss, and the recent Netflix film Tick, Tick, Boom, and also a mysterious guest, Margot, played by Anna Taylor-Joy, that just doesn't seem like she belongs amongst the group and Chef Slowick recognizes this. Hull's character is Tyler, alongside Margot, are two main symbolic character vehicles to help support Chef Slowick's messaging and story down the mysterious road that we are watching. Tyler is an obsessed foodie that is eager to impress and please our chef with his knowledge and is longing for acceptance from our authoritarian chef Slowick. Margot seems unimpressed with it all and is a good rebel character and contradicts but balances Fine's performance extremely well. Chef and Margot seem to be two polar opposites, but when on screen together alone, there is a mystic feeling that makes us want to have more interactions from these two. They bring out a likability in each other and they have a subtle respect for one another. And where this balance really shines is in the character shift from our chef, in which we know his intentions, we know something is off, we know he is there to do harm to get his point across, but Margot brings almost almost an innocence out of our chef that confuses the audience, but in a good way, to wonder if we should be rooting for him or against him. Fines plays a bad guy we love to watch, and by the end of the film, I wanted to see more of it. I only wish we could have gotten more one-on-one -on -one time between Margot and our chef. The scenes with these two are the most memorable of the movie. Now, the movie's humor is dry but entertaining, and the style is dark but appealing to watch. We can feel that we are at a dinner party of those that pay careful attention to social cues and boundaries around others and their class, but it never loses its disconnect from the audience, and it does so by its dry humor of poking fun at itself, especially with our over-the-top dinner courses. And this is thanks to not only the intriguing performances by the entire cast, but the direction of Mark Mylod from Game of Thrones and Entourage. The social satire is so hardcore here, even when a death happens, the restaurant patrons have a sense of shock of disbelief, but nobody wants to rock the status quo of standing out in front of a crowd to question why they saw what they saw. They presume it's part of the restaurant experience and part of Chef's storytelling. The movie is at its best when it attempts basic storytelling within its basic characters and sleek and basic limited setting environment. Where the menu struggles is when it starts to go in over its head when adding too much additional subtext and additional dialogue, and it almost plays like someone giving an elongated lie that they forget the facts in which they told, and their own facts gets lost even by them. The added context puts holes in the story from the characters saying too much and makes the audience scratch their heads and say, hey, hold on one minute here. That's not what you told us before. The film lacks the confidence in the simplistic elements of the script and tries to be smarter than what the story deems to be. Now, my lad's confidence shine in his direction. Writer Seth Reese, who is not new to the satire comedy world, with his experience with The New Yorker, Late Night with Seth Meyers and The Onion. And also writer Will Tracy, with his experience on The Onion and Last Week with John Oliver. You can almost feel the dialogue question itself from the second act to the start of the last act. Now, the dialogue is a small setback from the progression of the film, but you can feel my lad try to cover it with the look at this instead technique. And it's supported with an outstanding score by Colin Stenson from the composer of Hereditary. The score can be easily missed among the dialogue and the characters, and it's not in your face, but it blends into the setting extremely well to create the feeling of the environment. Now, sometimes scores can be easily overlooked just due to the perfect balance of how they tug at your mental and emotional state while you're engulfed into the story. And this is an outstanding example of the sleek style and music that are partners, not competitors. The menu isn't a four-star restaurant and has one of those endings that you will either love, hate, or just kind of shrug, but the film is successful on its mission of what it's trying to accomplish, even though it trips over itself a few times. But for every fault, there is something to enjoy and like, whether that's the great performances, the pretty dishes that make you even wonder how you eat the thing. Given the stiffness of the social environment, the restaurant may be for the rich high class, but the entire cast and direction from Mark Malode gives us the fun of eating at to Dave and Buster's. I'm giving the menu three stars.
Now, before we get into the rest of the show, don't forget to check out my reviews for movies that just hit streaming and are available to rent or buy now, including a film that's impossible not to smile at in Lyle Lyle Crocodile, which sang its way to three stars. A film you definitely won't be smiling at when you leave the theater, but on purpose in the horror film Smile, which received three stars as well. Dwayne Johnson joins the DC Universe in another disappointing DC film in Black Adam, in which he couldn't even use the powers of the gods to push it past one and a half stars. And finally, Viola Davis gives a performance of her career in The Woman King, which received three stars. You can find those reviews on my previous episodes. And just a reminder, if you haven't yet, make sure you hit follow or subscribe and leave me a review on Apple Podcast. And make sure you follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Letterboxd at MovieWire Show. Now, on the Thanksgiving episode, I let everybody know I would be appearing on the Casting Views podcast with Dan and Lou. That episode is now live, and let me tell you, this is one not to miss. I join Casting Views to discuss the topic of urban legends, from the most common legends of Bigfoot and Loch Ness to giant cats to Richard Gere. Things get a little out of control, and I want to thank Dan and Lou for inviting me on the show. It was truly a great time, and I hope all of you tune in and enjoy it as much as we did. The link will be in the description of this episode. Now let's hear from Dan and Lou. I'm Dan. I'm Lou. And together we are Casting Views. An uncle and nephew chatting on random topics. Some heavy, some fun, but we aim to amuse. Don't miss out. Don't delay. Subscribe to Casting Views today. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor and Good Pods. A radio host takes the call where an unknown person threatens to kill the showman's entire family on air. To save the loved ones, the radio host will have to play a survival game, and the only way to win is to find out the identity of the criminal in On the Line. All right, people. Settle in. Relax. Give me a call. This is On the Line. Are you ready? I'm always ready. We're expecting your calls. Talk to Elvis live on air and tell him about all of your issues and problems. If it isn't the greatest radio host. Okay, we got Gary on the line. What say you, Gary? (sighs) Gary, you with us? I'm going to do something really screwed up tonight. You at home? No. Does the... Home belong to someone you know? No. It belongs to somebody not very nice. And I'm I'm gonna take out his whole family. Gary, what was that? I'm breaking into the house. Hey, 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 Gary, stop, wait, come on. Why hurt his family? I mean, they're innocent. You're better than that, Gary. Tell me calmly. Where exactly are you? I'm at your house. Honey. Tonight, I've gone out of my way to make sure you spend the worst night of your life. See, I've created a game, and I think you're going to love it. This can still end well. But I don't want it to end well. I don't want to die here. Well, if we don't want to die, we got to fight. Now I want you to jump. So how about you tell us the truth? We're all listening. Show yourself, you slippery son of a... Now, before I get into the rest of the review, I just want to state there are a handful of films that I can say that the ending totally discredits the work of the rest of the movie. Usually I can pick pieces that the film does well and just ignore the climax. This movie's ending, I just can't get out of my head. And I actually broke out an online thesaurus to make a list of words that I could describe my feelings towards this ending. And here are just some of my favorites. Loathe, abomination, painful, disgust, despise, excruciating, agonizing, yucky, unacceptable, and my usual go-to of just plain awful. 
And it got to the point I wanted to take my hatred out on the climax on the rest of the film. I had to take a day to just gather my thoughts and take a breath and tell myself it's just an ending to a straight-to-streaming movie. And I almost didn't include this movie in the show just out of pure spite. Part of my frustration with the climax is that the film wasn't a masterpiece by any means, but it was truly entertaining for what it was. And I was actually enjoying myself for the most part. And I truly think that writer-director Romuald Boulanger thought he was being more clever for his own good. And it was hands down one of the worst endings I have ever seen in film. Now, with that out of the way, I have vented my frustration on the climax. This is a film that is pure definition of turning off your brain and ignoring all thought and logic. If they had film police, they would be handing out tickets left and right during this movie. Mel Gibson plays Elvis. Yes, our main character's name is Elvis. Elvis, who's an egotistical talk radio show host by what we get by assumption is a controversial host. But we don't get any real examples of this other than what the characters tell us. When we actually see Elvis talk on his radio show, he doesn't seem that bad. He's mild and tame, but apparently Elvis pisses somebody off where we see a mysterious caller hold Elvis's family hostage if he doesn't play by his rules. Now, like I said, the writing is awful and unrealistic, but the story is engaging even though it's unrealistic. The biggest thing holding this movie together are the performances and the chemistry from all the characters, especially Mel Gibson, who has an on-screen presence, is usually always in entertaining to at least watch. But what is refreshing is that the entire cast has seemed to have a great chemistry while on screen. We get the feel that his radio show crew actually does work together, which helps keeps us engaged in the progression of the story. The film tries to tackle moral dilemmas and moral decisions that seem so elementary, but our cast has to play off our main villain, played by Paul Spera, is a criminal mastermind. The entire film feels like a children's book dressed up like a thriller. Bellagier feels the need to spoon-feed the audience situations that are just plain stupid. Stupid. It's all recycled material that we have seen over and over again, only dumbed way, way down. The film is simplistic enough to have a couple of drinks and friends over to enjoy the great chemistry of our characters and poke fun at some of the obvious holes this film has. But with all that said, the film is laughable at times from the lack of background on the characters and the insane amount of plot holes. But I will give credit to its pacing. The film never really is boring and it paces along and the time just flies by. On the line doesn't over stay as welcome, but it will keep your attention for the most part. But that is all in part to the effort of the cast put into the cardboard writing. But the climax will piss a lot of people off because it is just so bad. But if you're just looking for something to just put on the TV and maybe just grab some popcorn, have a few drinks, a lot of drinks, and just enjoy something that will kill a couple hours, this film has you covered. I'm giving On the Line one and a half stars. Now I'm going to do something a little different this time around. I try and limit the amount of breaks from my reviews, but I couldn't contain myself and I have to bring up something that I'm extremely excited for. And I'm very excited for these two lovely ladies. Karen and Anne, my good friends over at the Sugar Coated Murders podcast, have released their very first book called Click, Click, Click. I picked up a copy and I have to say, this is a book you won't be able to put down. So if you haven't listened to the Sugar Coated Murders podcast, I will put Put their link in the description as well as a link to their brand new book that's available on Amazon right now. Pick up your copy today. Hey, Ann Barr. Hey, Karen Devaney. We need a promo. You know, like where we talk about what we do on our podcast. On our sugar coated murder podcast? Like how we love to bake and talk about murder? That's what we need to talk about. There you go. I think we've talked about it. Y'all find us on all your favorite listening apps. Stay sweet. And don't murder. Because if you kill people, we will talk about you. Based on the novel by Camille DeAngelis, love blossoms between a young woman in the margins of society and a disfranchised drifter as they embark on a 3,000-mile odyssey through the back roads of America. However, despite their best efforts, all roads leads back to their terrifying past and a final stand that will determine whether their love can survive the differences. Sounds like a road trip coming-of-age love story, doesn't it? I should also mention they are both cannibals in Bones and All. But you can't spend the night? Not all night. So where'd you move here from anyway? Eastern Shore. Yep. Try that. Dad! You 
didn't. When the cops get here, you have to be good and gone. I can't help you anymore. I know it's not your fault. You were born this way. You ate them. I believed you had to. I don't know why. I smelt you. I didn't know I could do that. I thought I was the only one. I don't want to hurt anybody. Famous last words. Are there lots of us? I don't actually meet many others. Why did you offer to bring me along? You seem nice. I am nice. I came looking for you. I smelled you. And you can smell me half a mile away. Can you do that? Not that far. I got rules. Never, never, ever ate an eater. I thought you might be hungry. For hens? No. Who lives here? Is there someone dead up there? I'm not gonna be like that. We don't have many options. Either you eat, you off yourself, or you lock yourself up in there. We're dangerous. You one of us? Chicks teach me I smell other eaters. <laughs> but we can hurt one another just as bad. Go, 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 go. It's too much. We gotta do this. We have to do it. You've been following me. And we got unfinished business. You don't think I'm a bad person. Now, I have a schedule of movies to watch each week, and I don't necessarily look at the trailers or synopsis or reviews before I attend. This is one of those movies I heard very little about. But I did peek at the IMDb synopsis while I was waiting for the film to start, and it reads as follows. Marin, a young woman, learns how to survive on the margins of society. That's it. That's a synopsis. As the first 10 to 15 minute plays in which we see a relationship between a father and daughter that seems pretty standard, but living in which seems to be a struggling life in the 80s. Then the film makes itself known as what its true intent is, and it took me by surprise on what the hell I was about to watch. If this is a film you're expecting a normal coming-of-age love story, maybe to take your loved one to on a date, one of two things will happen. One, you will walk out nauseated, or two, neither one of you will be getting lucky afterwards. This is not your standard coming-of-age love story, but that is also part of the uniqueness and special quality this film has. It takes a conventional plotline that we have seen numerous times and pulls a complete 360 on the audience with. Instead of going, oh, the audience will easily squirm in their seat and either go, ugh, or oh my god. Bones and All stars Timothy Calumet from Dune and Lady Bird as Lee, Taylor Russell from the film Waves as Marin, and my personal favorite Mark Rylance as Sully. If the cannibalistic behavior doesn't make you uncomfortable, then seeing Mark Rylance in nothing but tidy whities will. What makes Bones and All stand out in its execution is the fact it just doesn't rely on the act of cannibalism to make the film engaging, to get the shock and gross factor over and over again. The behavior is used to show a transition point and almost give growth for Lee and Marin as we see them progress through the film. The performances here are intentionally subtle to give the audience a sense of mystery, uncomfort, and curiosity of trust. As I watch this film, the curiosity and question of trust run through my mind on how much do you completely trust someone else that has the taste of human flesh. Mark Rylance's character right from his first appearance gaslights the audience on this sense of wonderment and it lingers in for the rest of the runtime. And it is very effective even when we get to the second half of the movie, the dialogue of our characters Marin and Lee seem to run out of steam and we tend to rely on supporting characters to push these two in the right motivational direction to remain relevant. Bones and All was written by David Koganich who has had some unique character-driven films including 2007 7's The Invasion, 2015's Bigger Splash, and 2018's Suspiria. You can tell the amount of care he put into this adaption to not overload it with everything possible from the novel, but more importantly ensure that Camille DeAngelis' story is told the way she would approve. His respect from the source material does shine through the dialogue during the complete runtime, even though at times it can feel a little halted during the second half of the movie. The source material and adaption is also supported by a clear vision from director Luca Gordonamo, who has also directed Suspiria and a bigger splash. These two creators have a good concept of vision of one another, 
and given the material that was presented to them by DeAngelis, it was a match made in heaven. Guadagnino also takes his time in creating a setting for his characters to flourish by the placement of where he puts his characters while they deliver their lines, and all is done perfectly. But where we see flaws is creating an environment for the audience to see along with our characters, with the lack of more wide-angle shot. With the lack of more wide-angle shots to really take in the environments of which our characters are facing. And when he does give us some of those wide-angle shots, they are brilliant, but the film needed more of them. This would have also added to the topic of trust by having the audience give a little bit of distance to sense more of the full body language from our main couple. Now, there are a lot of mistakes our couple makes in the film that do bring up a lot of questions, mainly surrounding the how. How have they not been caught? How do they clean up the mess? How are they so confident to drive around with blood all over them? The film steers away from even going into the discovery of these topics, but they linger during the movie as a mental distraction. The film is daring and brave to tackle such material and while respecting the original source material. The characters give a true understanding of the material by giving us some unique performances, but at times can run a little stale, but the mystery that the film surrounds itself with, not giving into temptation to just giving us the shock and awe factor, there is enough here to keep an audience on its toes to truly wonder where the story is going to take us. Along with the squirming in our seats, not just from the cannibalism, but from the performances, the film will truly not be for everyone, especially those that go into the film looking for a true romantic love story. But by the time the credits rolled, I really did appreciate the patience from the creators to create something a little different with the great execution of an adaption that could have gone south really quick. I'm giving Bones and All three stars. so hard to keep track and even have time to read all the trending topics on the web. Now there's a new app to help with all of those problems. Newsly is an audio app for iOS and Android. It picks up web articles about the most trending topics on the web at any given moment and reads them to you in a natural human voice. For the first time in the history of the internet, the entire web becomes listenable. Browse articles from topics you choose and start playing. You can follow any topic as specific as you like from sports, science, to Bitcoin. You can even follow Kardashian. It will find you the latest articles and read them to you out loud. And guess what? They have podcasts as well. Explore trending podcasts from over 50 countries. The Movie Wire is now a featured podcast on the Newsly app. Download and use Newsly for free now. The link will be in the description of this episode. You can also use one of my promo codes that you will find in the description as well to get you a one month free premium subscription. Stop scrolling, start listening, download Newsly today. Based on the New York Times investigation and the book She Said by New York Times reporter Megan Tuey and Jody Cantor, they break one of the most important stories in a generation, a story that helped ignite a movement and shattered decades of silence around sexual assault in Hollywood in She Said. Why is sexual harassment so pervasive and so hard to address? Let's interrogate the whole system. Hi, my name is Jody Cantor. I'm an investigative reporter for the New York Times. What have you got? I was told that the wrongdoing in Hollywood is overwhelming. I don't want to be quoted. Period. Understood. In your previous stories, how did you persuade women to tell you what had happened to them? A case I made was, I can't change what happened to you in the past, but together we may be able to help protect other people. The truth, basically. What is it exactly that we're looking at here? These young women walked into what they all had reason to believe were business meetings. I can still see it, the hotel room, the floor plan. He kept trying to touch me. I asked him to leave me alone. Instead, they say he met them with threats and sexual demands. I was young, scared. Hi. We're from the New York Times. I believe you used to work for Harvey Weinstein. People have tried to write this story before. He killed it every time. Harvey adamantly denies any allegation of assault. He played people. He was a master manipulator. Will you give me just one chance to talk to you? Are you sure that this isn't just young women who want to sleep with a movie producer to try to get ahead? This is bigger than Weinstein. This is about the system protecting abusers. The women who receive these settlements, they can't speak out. They'll be sued if they do. But if someone could speak freely about the payouts... What payouts, John? You have to imagine that every call you make is being recorded and you're being followed. Can you imagine how many Harveys there are out there? You want to get me killed. 
Do you wish she hadn't signed up for this story? Do you? No. The only way these women are going to go on the record is if they all jump together. We're all here, Harvey. Who have you talked to? I have three daughters, and I don't want them to ever accept abuse or bullying. I'll go on the record. Go write. It's time to write. This is all going to come up. I was silenced. I want my voice back. The film should have been named after Joe Friday from Dragnik's memorable line, Just the Facts, Ma'am. Now, I've stated recently, I have a lot of problems with films that are based on or inspired by. These films have their problems of over-dramatizing events. This film will not be a victim of that. She said almost feels like sitting across from a lawyer for its entire runtime. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It is as true as you're going to get trying to stick to just the facts. And at times, this will hold the film back. Now, I'm not going to lie. I was looking forward to this movie just out of pure vengeance. I wanted to see the portrayal of Harvey Weinstein squirm. I wanted to see his face as he faces these allegations. I wanted revenge from this movie for these women that he victimized. But that's not the film I got, and rightfully so, and understandably so. And as the film goes on, I can appreciate to an extent that this isn't a film of vengeance or revenge, but rather the story of brave women that stood up for justice and having their story told. And I can appreciate that. But this film also has a responsibility to its messaging that it's trying to portray. The film states on numerous occasions that a reporter is Megan 2A and Jodie Cantor, played by Carrie Mulligan and Zoe Kazan, one wanted to get this story out to ensure that the disgusting act stop and so it won't happen to anybody else. This film had an opportunity to show and demonstrate the examples that our brave reporters show through visuals and a retelling of the story, to inspire those watching to stand up for those that mistreat, harass, and sexually assault and try to use their power to justify why they can. There will always be an individual that has the mentality to show why they can, and that's not just the disgusting Harvey Weinstein, and this film has an international audience to tell its factual story and give it meaning. And it gives these brave women's stories a chance to inspire those that are afraid to speak out. Well, she said runs like a pretty cut and dry, straightforward, accurate tale of events. There's no edge. There's no well-deserved time spent with any of the characters to truly feel the emotion from any of the characters in which we should. And that includes our two reporters, Megan and Jody. And though the performances are solid here by Mulligan and Kazan, there is no true knowledge of motivation. There is no true origin stories of these two on drive within the story. But the film sticks to the source material by 2A and Cantor to just stick to the facts of the events of what transpired with the Weinstein investigation. And again, I can appreciate the factual awareness of this story, but this movie could have been so much more if it just slowed down to realize that there is so much more to discover within its factual characters to ensure a meaningful message gets across. But it is too concentrated on integration of more and more and more women involved, and it gets to the point where the transition and editing becomes so repetitive where it's easy to lose one's attention span and remember the women involved, and that loses meaning from the bravery these women came to face by telling their story. We want to remember, we want to know their story. With so much loaded in this with a little focus, it becomes harder and harder to remember and keep track. I do applaud Ashley Judd and Gwyneth Paltrow, who appeared in the book and the film, to give their accounts of what happened, especially Paltrow, who is one of the first to come forward to speak against Weinstein to help ensure change in Hollywood. And in complete fairness, this was a difficult film to make and probably a difficult book to actually write. In no way, shape, or form will either give the stories justice to what the women actually went through. And you can tell the material was obviously written by reporters because that's the feel we get from the movie. It feels like our watch watching a two-hour breaking news story. But the direction is also the big part of the problem here. The film was written by Maria Schreider, and this is her biggest film to date to direct. And what is really lacking is a sense of tension and emotion from its cast. The ensemble feels more like robots. It's like when you call customer service and you tell them there's an issue. It's always a robotic, unsympathetic, I'm sorry to hear that. There's a scene where we see the New York Times interact with Weinstein in person. That could have given us a looking glass into the evil of which is Harvey Weinstein. But the film steers away from hearing from Weinstein, and we barely see or hear from him in the film. Again, I can respect the intent of not featuring him completely in this film and to focus on the New York Times story and the bravery and pain of the victims, but then the film steers away from even getting to know these brave women. Walking out of She Said, I didn't feel like I gained anything for what I already felt about the Weinstein investigation. It was fascinating to learn some things that the media didn't cover during the Weinstein investigation. And the film has all the right intentions, but lacks focus on the actions and consequences of Weinstein and doesn't give more credit to the bravery and victims' lives and the frustration of how the system is broken as it still is today. And right when we think the movie's going to take us somewhere that you want it to go, it goes somewhere else. It feels like a history lesson. 
this is one of those movies that will most likely be thrown into the best picture category just so the Academy can give a more common movie for the audience to root for, but holistically, there are better movies that have been made this year. But what should be recognized are the women that stood up against Weinstein and took the risk to go against the Hollywood disgusting norm to have this story come to light. That's what I would like to see at the Oscars, and they deserve a standing ovation for the bravery they showed and to have this story told. She plays like watching a breaking news story and ends with an exclamation mark punctuation for its emotional impact. I'm giving She Said two and a half stars. And that's a cut on this week's edition of The Movie Wire. I want to thank you all for your support and thank you for listening. You can also show support by following me on Instagram, Twitter, and Letterboxd at Movie Wire Show. Until next week, do me a favor. Make sure you stay for after the credits to show your respect for those that put their blood, sweat, and tears into making a feature film. And make sure you support your local movie theaters. A verdict has been made on this episode of The Movie Wire by your host, Justin Hansen. He thanks you for listening to the show. You can follow Justin on Instagram and Twitter at Movie Wire Show or visit his website, www.themoviewire.com. Oh, and don't forget to leave a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Until next time, we will see you. At the movies. Thank you for bringing me to the movies.